So my talk is over the broad leaves, uh, which broad leaves are kind of, I think they're forgotten a lot of times in mixes. Um, I, to me, it doesn't matter what your mix is for. I think there's always room for a broad leaf, and <clears throat> they're kind of the forgotten, the forgotten species. You know, your legumes are, everybody's always wanting to, to make more nitrogen, you know, your biomass from your grasses, and then all the benefits from the brassicas. But I really want to drive home why, why broad leaves um, are important. So why, why broad leaves? <clears throat> Diverse family groups. You know, your legumes are all in the same family group. Your grasses are all in the same family group. Your brassicas are all in the same family group. The broad leaves is where you start to diversify those family groups. And Dr. Christine Jones is, is really always hit home about at least four different family groups, and the more, the better. Um, and this is where you can really start to diversify those family groups. Diverse roots and diverse leaf structure. Um, I think this, this family group has the largest structural difference in those categories. Um, diverse function in the soil. You know, your legumes, they produce nitrogen, which is great. We need that. Your grasses have the fibrous roots. Um, the broad leaves really can, can bring a lot of other great components uh, to that soil system. Um, and then a diverse nutritional food source for livestock. Uh, we all know how important, <clears throat> you know, protein is, um, you know, how, how just, you know, dry forage matter, but we also need that multivitamin or that mineral component, and this is where the, the broadleaves can help fill that niche. And then great for pollinators, and, and I thought I changed that, but diverse for pollinators. A lot of diverse uh, flowering species, a lot of different colors, different size of flowers, different flowering times throughout the year, so it really can, can be really great for those pollinators and those beneficial insects. <clears throat> Buckwheat's the first one, uh, family group. I, I'm not going to pronounce that, but, but it's different. Um, the, I think the biggest thing that buckwheat is famous for is its ability to phos uh, solubilize phosphorus in the soil. So it is able to produce a mild acid that can make, you know, tied up phosphorus and other nutrients available. Um, you know, I, I don't know what some of those other nutrients are, but I don't think it's only limited to phosphorus, but that's always the big one. And phosphorus is always super tied up in the soil. so can really help help with that. <clears throat> uh, this is an excellent pollinating, quick pollinating broadleaf. You know, you saw the butterfly before, also great for bees. Um, I, I like this picture because, you know, it's a picture of a wasp, which, you know, yeah, around our house, we really don't like to see the wasps, or I don't, but these guys can really take down some larger non-beneficial insects, you know, your worms, um, things like that, that, you know, your other... Lady beetles, uh, some of your smaller beneficials may not be able to. You know, these guys can. Um, but this is also going to be a great housing for any other lace wings, um, you know, lady beetles, things like that. Also, uh, this is probably one of the better, I believe, weed suppressors of the broadleaf family. Um, you don't get a lot of that from broadleaves, but planted at a, at a pretty high rate can really outgrow and smother some weeds. Um, and then also buckwheat has a hollow stem, so can be utilized for some roller crimping um, more so than, than a lot of the other broadleaves. Okra, um, again, different family group. I just want to keep pointing that out that every one of these is going to have a different family group that it's involved in. Um, you know, okra is probably most famous for, for its edible seed pods. You know, pickled okra, I sure like. It's, it's really good. But in a cover crop mix, the, uh, the tap root and its ability to withstand heat and drought is, is its probably two strongest points. And you can see here in this, uh, you know, in this root dig here how deep those roots are going. And, I mean, that's really poor soil. Uh, but, but you can see how deep those roots are going, accessing nutrients deeper in that soil profile and water. Um, is a good mix, good addition to a grazing mix, especially for a stockpile. Um, those seed pods, I mean, can get very large and, um, you know, can be a great food source for that livestock uh, going into the, to the winter months. Um, and then a very large leaf structure. So when you're talking photosynthesis, your solar panels, this can really, uh, really start to fill in uh, some of those, you know, some of those areas within that mix. Don't need a lot. It is, it is a, 
of the broad leaves, it's probably your larger investment. So, you know, a pound goes is is more than sufficient. I think um, you start getting much more than that, then you know the mix kind of becomes non-economical at that point. But certainly a good addition um, for really those drought heat heat areas. Uh, the cucurbit family, again, different family name. Uh, the nice thing about cucurbits, uh, so think of your watermelons, your gourds, your pumpkins, your cucumbers. Uh, they're very viney. So again, a little bit, you know, half pound, maybe a quarter pound in a mix can start to fill in gaps um, where, you know, for whatever reason, maybe you do, you know, something's not growing there. Uh, we can cover that soil, bring in that sunlight. Um, the fruit production of most of these, uh, not only can you consume them or pick them for Halloween, fall decorations, great source uh, for livestock uh, in a stockpile mix. And I believe there are some antiparasitic properties uh, to, to especially pumpkins and gourds. So good, <clears throat> good resource there. Another, again, with all of our broad leaves, I think it, it's a good pollinating species. Puts on them nice, colorful, bright yellow flowers. Um, can bring in a lot of <clears throat> a lot of bug, a lot of good bugs that way, and then again the the variety of species. Um, in our cucurbit blend, I think we have all of all of those, and then I think there's some zucchini in there as well. So get a good uh, good diverse mix there. So the next two, um, safflower and sunflower. Now they are going to be in the same family uh, group, so you know not much diversity there. But again, a different family family group name. Uh, the thing I like about safflower is its wide uh, planting window. You know, it is considered a warm season broadleaf, but I have put it in some spring mixes, and it will handle a light frost um, in the spring and can be planted later in the fall, um, you know, to get some of the benefits of it. Um, <clears throat> can be utilized as a, as a grazing uh, forage. Uh, now, as long as you get the spineless, which is what we sell, uh, either the seed pot, the seeds uh, produced can can offer some good stockpile mixes. Um, I have heard if you do get the spineless, it can uh, plant it around a field border, can kind of act as a natural barrier for predators. You know, coyote, fox, whatever, isn't going to want to probably run through that uh, full of spines. So something to consider if you do find yourself some some spined varieties. Um, again, great pollinator. You know, yellow flower. Um, lots of flowers, um, and this is a good one, along with the sunflower, for, for really good deep compaction breaking up. Sunflower, <clears throat> so same family as the safflower. Again, I, I, keep, I know I keep repeating myself, but it's just, to me, that's how important they are, is their, their pollinating ability. Um, so we all, we all have seen the bees around the sunflowers. We all look, know how pretty they look. Uh, this can really... Uh, I think this can add some value, uh, you know, agritourism value to a cover crop. Uh, people like to take pictures with sunflowers. Uh, the seed head production uh, from the sunflowers, uh, really good for stockpile forage. High protein content, high oil content uh, can really help help with uh, forage there in the in the fall. Uh, like the taproot on a sunflower. Kind of the neat thing about the sunflower is, you know, not only does it have a really deep tap root, but you can kind of see a lot of the, you know, the fibrous brace roots it has there as well. So you kind of get the best of both worlds there. The neat thing I think about sunflowers is they are a, a soil cleanser. They're able to get a lot of heavy metals out of the soil, um, able to process that, you know, kind of cleanse that soil. And they're even known for their ability to get radiation out of the soil. I know there's not a lot of radiation here, but uh, the, uh, the uh, nuclear plant in Chernobyl, uh, sunflowers grow really well there because they're able to handle the high amounts of radiation in the soil. And then uh, the, uh, the highly uh, mycorrhizal friendly function of this plant is, I think, key as well. Getting that mycorrhizal fungi, which is <clears throat> key to you know, accessing uh, especially tied up nutrients in that, that hard uh, sediment, just an extension of that root hair. One thing I want to add about the sunflower too, this is not like a wild sunflower. Larger seed uh, and a seed that is actually probably more desirable to your birds and smaller insects that curl on the ground. So even if it does go to seed production, 
chances of it becoming a problem are very, very slim. Um, and we also, not only do we offer the black oil sunflowers, we do usually have a little bit of the, the Russian mammoths. Um, so, if, you know, something you want to add to a, to a garden or something, you know, they can get quite, uh, quite tall and, and very impressive. Flax, uh, again, different plant family. Uh, I took this picture here. I actually dug this. Uh, this is a this was a mix uh, planted in western Kansas, and, and what really impressed me is about this is flax's above ground biomass is not very impressive, you know, just kind of a long spindly plant, but it really it really does have a very nice root system, um, and it's a smaller seed, so two three pounds in a mix uh, goes a long ways. I do like to add flax to grazing mixes, uh, and the reason why, livestock tend to avoid it. Um, it's got a bitter taste. They don't really care for it. And the reason I put it in is, hey, you know, we all get busy, and maybe you don't get that livestock rotated as quickly as you want to. You know, if they graze everything else down, maybe there's some flax left standing kind of to keep some, keep some biomass on top of the soil. And then another very highly mycorrhizal fungi friendly uh, species here. Again, beneficial insect attractor, uh, very nice blue flowers, um, you know, more of a cool season variety. So spring planting, fall planting, uh, you know, if you're looking to maybe do some weed interseed, I, I've heard some pretty positive things about adding some flax to a winter, uh, winter wheat interseed. Um, it's going to winter kill, so no need to worry about herbicide or or anything, uh, anything overseeding um, and becoming an issue with the wheat uh, next winter. Phacelia, uh, again, different, different plant family. Uh, this is this is another good, uh, really beneficial insect attractor. You know, the very <clears throat> a lot of pretty flowers there, purple flowers. Um, I uh, was thinking earlier this this plant kind of reminds me of my daughter. It's a uh, very pretty you know, very sweet, kind of a little short little plant, but very fibrous root, very just wild, um, you know, underneath the surface. So that's kind of, I was just thinking of that. I'm like, yeah, that's maybe that's what I need to, you know, Clint alluded to naming our kids after uh, cover crops. So, but, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, smaller seeds, so good for broadcasting, I think. Uh, and, you know, a little bit goes a long ways with facilia. I mean, probably 400, 450,000 seeds per pound. So half a pound goes a long ways. Really, really well suited in, in spring mixes, uh, fall mixes. There's probably even some, some good grazing that can come of it. Just again, you know, we're looking for a diverse diet <clears throat> out of this. The last two um, are two perennial broadleaves that we have. Um, again, different family group. Uh, chicory is, has a very, very big tap root. Um, and really does well in, in wetter uh, conditions. So can access, you know, can really open up that, <clears throat> open up those wetter areas of the field of your pasture and allow that moisture to, to, get, to get down in there. Uh, so very tolerant of wet soils. Great grazing addition to a lot of perennials. Um, or even if you're transitioning to a perennial system, adding this to some annuals as you transition can be a good fit. Uh, Small seed, so you know half pound to a pound. Um, the reason it, it does uh, it is a good grazing addition is it does contain some antibiotic, antiparasitic uh, properties that you know the livestock will will kind of seek this out to to help regulate. <clears throat> and the last one, uh, plantain. You know again different uh, different plant family, kind of a lot of the same uh, same attributes as chicory. Um, you know, a smaller seed and, and a lot of the, you know, same antiparasitic, antibiotic uh, properties to it. Um, so good addition to, to any perennial mix. <clears throat> Thank you.